The Thing from Another World, sometimes referred to as Just the Thing, is a 1951 American black and white science fiction horror film, directed by Christian N. Y. By, produced by Edward Lasker for Howard Hawks Winchester Pictures Corporation, and released by RKO Pictures. The film stars Margaret Sheridan, Kenneth Toby, Robert Cornthwaite, and Douglas Spencer. James Arness plays the thing, but he is difficult to recognize in costume and makeup due to both low lighting and other effects used to obscure his features. The Thing from Another World is based on the 1938 novella Who Goes There? By John W. Campbell writing under the pseudonym of Don A. Stewart, the film's storyline concerns a U.S. Air Force crew and scientists who find a crashed flying saucer and a humanoid body frozen in the Arctic ice, near the craft. Returning to their remote research outpost with the body still in a block of ice, they are forced to defend themselves against the still alive and malevolent plant-based alien when it is accidentally defrosted. Topic. Plot In Anchorage, journalist Ned Scott Douglas Spencer, looking for a story, visits the Air Force Officers Club, where he meets Captain Pat Hendry Kenneth Toby, his co-pilot Lieutenant Eddie Dykes, a friend of Scott's, and flight navigator Ken Mac McPherson. General Fogarty orders Hendry to fly to Polar Expedition 6 at the North Pole, per a request from its lead scientist, Nobel laureate Dr. Arthur Carrington Robert Cornthwaite. Carrington has radioed that an unusual aircraft has crashed nearby. With Scott, Corporal Barnes, Crew Chief Bob, a pack of sled dogs, Hendry pilots a Douglas C-47 transport to the remote outpost. Upon arrival, Scott and the airmen meet radio operator Tex, Mrs. Chapman, Lee, one of two cooks, and the Inuit dog handlers. Also present are scientists Voorhees, Stern, Redding, Stone, Lawrence, Wilson, Ambrose, Auerbach, Olson, Mrs. Chapman's husband Dr. Chapman, and Carrington. Hendry later rekindles his romance with Nikki Nicholson Margaret Sheridan, Carrington's secretary. Several scientists fly with the airmen to the crash site, finding a large object buried beneath melted ice. As they spread out to determine its shape, they realize they are standing in a circle, they have discovered a flying saucer. The team attempts to melt the ice covering the saucer with thermite, but a violent reaction with the craft's metal alloy completely destroys it. The Geiger counter, however, detects something, a frozen body, buried nearby, it is excavated in a large block of ice and loaded aboard the transport. They fly out as an Arctic storm closes in on the site. Hendry assumes command of the outpost and denies Scott permission to send out his story, he also denies the scientists' demands to examine the body. Tex sends an update to Fogarty, and the airmen settle in as the storm arrives. A watch is posted, Barnes relieves McPherson and, disturbed by the creature's appearance in the clearing ice, covers it with an electric blanket, which he does not realize is plugged in. The block slowly thaws and the creature, still alive, escapes into the storm and is attacked by the sled dogs. The airmen recover the creature's severed arm after the attack. The scientists examine the arm, concluding that the alien is an advanced form of plant life. Carrington is convinced of its superiority to humans and becomes intent on communicating with it. The airmen begin a search, which leads to the outpost's greenhouse. Carrington stays behind with Voorhees, Stern, and Lawrence, having noticed evidence of alien activity. They discover a third sled dog hidden away, which has had all of its blood drained. The creature feeds on blood. Carrington and the scientists post a secret watch of their own, hoping to encounter the alien before the airmen find it. The next morning, the airmen continue their search. Tex informs them that Fogarty is aware of their discovery and demands further information, now prevented by the fierce storm. Stern appears, badly injured, and tells the group that the creature has killed Auerbach and Olsen. When the airmen investigate, the alien attacks them, they manage to barricade it inside the greenhouse. Hendry confronts Carrington and orders him to remain in his lab and quarters. 
Carrington, obsessed with the alien, shows Nicholson and the other scientists his experiment, using seeds taken from the severed arm, he has been growing small alien plants by feeding them from the blood plasma supply. Hendry finds the plasma missing when it is needed to treat Stern, which ultimately leads him back to Carrington. Fogarty transmits orders to keep the creature alive, but it escapes from the greenhouse and attacks the airmen in their quarters. They douse it with buckets of kerosene and set it afire, forcing it to retreat into the storm. After regrouping, they realize that the building's temperature is falling rapidly, the furnaces have stopped working, sabotaged by the alien. They retreat to the station's generator room to keep warm, and rig an electrical fly trap. The alien continues to stalk them, but at the last moment, Carrington attempts to communicate, pleading with the creature. It knocks him aside, walks into the set trap, and is electrocuted and reduced to just a pile of ash on Hendry's direct order. When the weather clears, Scotty is finally able to file his story of a lifetime by radio to a roomful of reporters in Anchorage. He begins his broadcast with a warning. Tell the world. Tell this to everybody, wherever they are. Watch the skies everywhere. Keep looking. Keep watching the skies. Topic. Cast Kenneth Toby as Captain Patrick Hendry Margaret Sheridan as Nicky Nicholson Robert Cornthwaite as Dr. Arthur Carrington Douglas Spencer as Ned Scott Scotty, James Young as Lieutenant Eddie Dykes Dewey Martin as Bob, crew chief. Robert Nichols as Lieutenant Ken McPherson. William Self as Corporal Barnes. Edward Franz as Dr. Stern. Paul Fries as Dr. Voorhees, uncredited. John Dierks as Dr. Chapman, uncredited. George Fenneman as Dr. Redding, uncredited. Everett Glass as Dr. Wilson, uncredited. Edmund Brion as Dr. Ambrose, uncredited. Norbert Schiller as Dr. Lawrence, uncredited. Sally Creighton as Mrs. Chapman. Nicholas Byron as Tex Richards, uncredited. David McMahon as General Fogarty, uncredited. James Arness as The Thing. Topic: Production. No actors are named during the film's dramatic, slow-burning letters through background opening title sequence, while the cast credits appear at the end of the film. No performers are named in the film's advertising graphics. Many cast members with significant speaking parts are not credited. Appearing in a small role was George Fenneman, who at the time was gaining fame as Groucho Marx's announcer on the popular quiz show You Bet Your Life. Fenneman later said he had difficulty with the overlapping dialogue in the film. The film was partly shot in Glacier National Park and interior sets built at a Los Angeles ice storage plant. The film took full advantage of the national feelings in America at the time in order to help enhance the horror elements of the film's storyline. The film reflected a post Hiroshima skepticism about science and prevailing negative views of scientists who meddle with things better left alone. In the end it is American servicemen and several sensible scientists who win the day over the alien invader. Topic. Screenplay The film was loosely adapted by Charles Lederer, with uncredited rewrites from Howard Hawks and Ben Hecht, from the 1938 novella Who Goes There? By John W. Campbell, Jr., the story was first published in Astounding Science Fiction under Campbell's pseudonym Don A. Stewart. Campbell had just become Astounding's managing editor when his novella appeared in its pages. The film's screenplay changes the fundamental nature of the alien as presented in Campbell's 1938 novella, Lederer's Thing is a humanoid life form whose cellular structure is closer to vegetation, although it must feed on blood to survive. Reporter Scott even refers to it in the film as a super carrot. 
The internal, plant-like structure of the creature makes it impervious to bullets but not to other destructive forces. Campbell's thing is a life form capable of assuming the physical and mental characteristics of any living thing it encounters. This characteristic was later realized in John Carpenter's adaptation of the novella, the 1982 film The Thing. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Director. There is still debate as to whether the film was directed by Howard Hawks, with Christian N. Y. by receiving the credit so that N. Y. by could obtain his Directors Guild membership. Or whether N. Y. by directed it with considerable input in both screenplay and directing advice from producer Hawks for Hawks Winchester Pictures, which released the film through RKO Radio Pictures Inc. Hawks gave N. Y. by only $5,460 of RKO's $50,000 director's fee and kept the rest, but Hawks always denied that he directed the film. Cast members disagree on Hawks and Nyby's contributions. Toby said that. Hawks directed it, all except one scene. While, on the other hand, Fenneman said that, Hawks would once in a while direct, if he had an idea, but it was Chris show. Cornthwaite said that, Chris always deferred to Hawks. Maybe because he did defer to him, people misinterpreted it. Although Self has said that, Hawks was directing the picture from the sidelines. He also has said that, Chris would stage each scene, how to play it. But then he would go over to Howard and ask him for advice, which the actors did not hear. Even though I was there every day, I don't think any of us can answer the question. Only Chris and Howard can answer the question. One of the film's stars, William Self, later became president of 20th Century Fox Television. In describing the production, Self said, Chris was the director in our eyes, but Howard was the boss in our eyes. At a reunion of the Thing cast and crew members in 1982, N.Y. By said, Did Hawks direct it? That's one of the most inane and ridiculous questions I've ever heard, and people keep asking. That it was Hawks' style. Of course it was. This is a man I studied and wanted to be like. You would certainly emulate and copy the master you're sitting under, which I did. Anyway, if you're taking painting lessons from Rembrandt, you don't take the brush out of the master's hands. Topic. Reception Topic. Critical and box office reception The Thing from Another World was released in April 1951. By the end of that year, the film had accrued $1,950,000 in distributors' domestic US and Canada rentals, making it the year's 46th biggest earner, beating all other science fiction films released that year, including The Day the Earth Stood Still and When Worlds Collide. Bosley Crowther in The New York Times observed, Taking a fantastic notion, or is it, really, Mr. Hawks has developed a movie that is generous with thrills and chills, adults and children can have a lot of old-fashioned movie fun at the thing, but parents should understand their children and think twice before letting them see this film if their emotions are not properly conditioned. Jean, in Variety complained that the film lacks genuine entertainment values. More than 20 years after its theatrical release, science fiction editor and publisher Lester Del Rey compared the film unfavorably to the source material, John W. Campbell's Who Goes There, calling it, "...just another monster epic, totally lacking in the force and tension of the original story." The Thing is now considered by many to be one of the best films of 1951. The film holds an 88% fresh. Rating at the film review aggregator website Rotten Tomatoes, with the consensus that the film is better than most flying saucer movies, thanks to well-drawn characters and concise, tense plotting. In 2001, the United States Library of Congress deemed the film 
culturally significant and selected it for preservation in the National Film Registry. Additionally, Time magazine named The Thing from Another World, the greatest 1950s sci fi movie. Legacy The Thing from Another World is considered one of the great science fiction films of the 1950s. American Film Institute lists AFI's 100 Years. 100 Thrills No. 87 Related productions In 1980, Fantasy Newsletter reported that Wilbur Stark had bought the rights to several old RKO Pictures fantasy films, intending to remake them, and suggested the most significant of these purchases was The Thing from Another World. This soon led to the making of a more faithful adaptation of Campbell's story, directed by John Carpenter, released in 1982 under the title The Thing, with Stark as executive producer. It paid homage to the 1951 film by using the same, slow burning letters through background opening title sequence. Matthijs van Heiningen Jr. made a 2011 prequel to Carpenter's 1982 film using the same title, The Thing. A colorized version of the original film was released in 1989 on VHS by Turner Home Entertainment. It was billed as an RKO color classic. Topic. See also 1951 in film Christian NY by List of films featuring extraterrestrials Notes <laughs> <laughs>